do how are you that's on the mic All right, buddy. Pursuant to Section 8414.11 of Nebraska Statutes, the notice of this meeting was given on August 1, 2019. The meeting will convene at 6.30 p.m., and visitors may obtain a request to be heard for them for any presentation they may have for the meeting. In accordance with policy, the request to be heard forms must be submitted to the Secretary within the first five minutes of the board meeting in order to be heard at this meeting. Agenda items are subject to reordering at the discretion of the board president. Please intend the entire meeting to assure you're able to hear any discussion. Thank you.
Pursuant to Section 8414 of Nebraska Statutes, the next regular meeting of the Board of Education of Douglas County School District 0001 and Board of Educational Service Unit Number 19 will be held on Monday, August 19th at 6.30 p.m. in the Board Meeting Room of the Teacher Administrative Center, 3215 Cumming Street. The agenda will be kept current and available for public inspection in the Office of the Secretary of the Board of Education at the Administrative Building during regular working hours. Pursuant to Section 8414.12 of Nebraska Statutes, the public is hereby informed that a current copy of the Nebraska Open Meetings Act is posted in the board meeting room on the north wall. Please stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. and life. Mr. Ray, roll call please. Cassidy. <laughs> Godding. Allman. Here. Cracky. Here. Perlman? Here. Ryan? Present. Smith? Here. Snipe? Present. No. Aye. All. Aye. Cracky. Aye. Perlman. Aye. Ryan. Aye. Smith. Aye. Snipe. Aye. Seven. Aye. Thank you. Moving on to school spotlight with Kayla Morsey. Good evening, Board President Snow, members of the board, and Superintendent Dr. Logan. We are pleased to present Skills USA Nebraska state student winners as tonight's OPS Proud Spotlight. Skills USA is a national membership association serving high school, college, and middle school students who are preparing for careers in trade, technical, and skilled service occupations, including health occupations and for further education. Skills USA is a partnership of students, teachers, and industry working together to ensure America has a skilled workforce. Skills USA helps each student excel. More than 345,000 students and advisors join Skills USA each year, organized into more than 19,000 local chapters and 52 state and territorial associations. There are nearly 21,000 teachers serving as professional members and Skills USA advisors. This year's state competition took place this past April in Grand Island, Nebraska. Each of the 102 comp competitions fall under one of 11 categories known as sectors. The categor categories are arts and communications, construction, health sciences, hospitality and tourism, human services, information technology, leadership, manufacturing, public service, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and transportation. The following students earned first place recognition at this year's state competition. For advertising and design, Alicia Zimpleman of Benston High Magnet School. For broadcast news production, Will Byerman, Kara Ledwich, Emily Ortiz Cantu, and Lucas Sennett of the Career Center. For firefighting, Ian Perry of North High Magnet. For first aid CPR, Shar So of Career Center. For mobile robotics technology, Isaac Beacom and Tanner Sassy of Benson High Magnet. For precision machining technology for the state, Jordan Cowden of North High Magnet. And for the state t-shirt contest, Lillian Kirby of Benson High Magnet. We also recognize Thomas Sibbett 
of Benson High who was selected to serve on the Nebraska Board of Directors for the 1920 school year. We congratulate these young people on their accomplishments and at this time we welcome Career Center Director Jeremy Cowley to the podium for remarks. Board President Snow, uh, Dr. Logan, Board of Education, thank you so much um, for allowing us to be here tonight um, to um, represent all the Skills USA students within Omaha Public Schools. And the three fine young people I have here with me tonight uh, represent really the cream of the crop of students that we have in our district that put in countless hours in the classroom and outside of the classroom preparing uh, to uh, show off their talents. Um, at state competition. Just a few other honors that, um, that this group um, boasts. Um, all three have uh, recently graduated from Omaha Public Schools and are all continuing on this fall at uh, UNO and Metro Community College um, following in lines of their uh, career training programs that they received in Omaha Public Schools. So we're very excited about that. Additionally, um, just a, a few other honors. Uh, Tanner Sassy, uh, here to my left, um, represented Omaha Public Schools and represented the state of Nebraska as a state officer this past year for Skills USA. And additionally, Tanner represented uh, Benson High and the state of Nebraska at the national competition in Louisville, Kentucky this summer where uh, he and Isaac Beacom uh, received third place in the nation in their um, mobile robotics. Uh, technology competition. So great honors for these students. Uh, certainly welcome you to ask them any questions that you may have. These are outstanding young people and uh, we certainly want to bring them all the honor that is deserved to them. Thank you guys so much uh, for making us OPS proud. If you guys could uh, say your name, obviously the school that you attended and uh, a little bit about your competition and, and just how you prepared for it and just your overall experience. So starting with you, Tanner, and I believe this is like your 10th time at the board table. <laughs> Welcome back. Thank you. My name is Tanner Sassy. I recently graduated from Benson High. My competition was mobile robotics. And basically, you, um, this year, well, every year there's a new game. Um, this year there was balls and there was flags and caps. Basically, you'd have to pick up the balls and find a way to shoot these balls at these flags. Now, when you shot the flag, it would turn to the different color, and that's how you would score points. You could also score by flipping caps to the opposing color. For, exa um, for example, if a cap was facing up blue and you turned it to red, that would be one point. Also, there is high post and low post. You could pick these caps up and score them on these posts. A high post would be worth two points, I believe, and a low post would be worth one point. Awesome. And, and your, your robot, how big was it? Was it small? Um, it has to be within 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches, but can oh expand once the, ma um, once the match starts. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, we'll go through everybody and then open up the table for board members with a question. Good afternoon. My name is Charso. I just graduated from Central High School. Uh, my competition was um, first aid and CPR. So how that works is we have our written portions and our skills portions. Um, to me, the written portion, portion was very easy. Um, whereas the, the skills, um, we have to check uh, for the scenes and check to see what um, what's going on with the um, the patients. I'd say. Um, so my patient, um, she. She has a broken arm and a broken leg, so I have to put the slings on her and just like check for everything, every minor things that she has. And for the CPRs, we um, so for CPR, um, it, we just have to do 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths. Uh, so I was very prepared when I was there. Everything that I like I used at the competition, I learned in the classroom, so I was very prepared. Awesome, thank you. And Shai, you went to uh, you went to, with us to France. You went to France. Yes, Correct. I did. Yeah. So she was one of the students that uh, represented uh, Central High JROTC and at the commemoration for D-Day, and only overslept one morning, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have that right? I don't think that was me. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Somebody who was good looking like you, though. <laughs> 
All right. Evening. My name is Ian Perry, recent graduate of North High School as well as the Omaha Public Schools Career Center. Uh, I competed in firefighting. Uh, test or the competition consists uh, of a written test, a physical test, as well as a set of practical firefighting skills. Um, the written test was over basic firefighter one, firefighter two knowledge. The physical test was a modified version of the national standard test, the CPAT. And then the uh, practical skills were anything a firefighter should be uh, expected to do. Raise a ladder, drag a victim, advance a hose line, stuff like that. Uh, I prepared for my competition. Uh, this is my third year, so I had some idea what I was doing, and also serving uh, the area around Northwest High School as an Irvington volunteer firefighter. Oh my goodness, thank you. I will open up uh, colleagues if you have any questions or comments. Mrs. Cracky. I just wonder if each of you are going forward in that career lane and the firefighters you're just almost stepping in the door aren't you uh yeah prior volunteer experience helps um i'm looking at uh, a four-year stint at metro for uh, paramedic as well as a degree in That's fire science right. and what about you what are you doing um i just got a job as a cna at where um at the jewish home okay and then what are you going to do um, I'm going to an election. I'm going to major in biology. Okay. For me at UNO, um, right now I'm looking at mechanical engineering and possibly a minor in robotics because unfortunately Nebraska doesn't offer robotics as a major, but I still want to continue using the valuable skills that I've been building for the past four years and hopefully um, I can do something with that. All of them sound so good, and congratulations to all of you and your teachers that help you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. We would love to shake all your hands and congratulate you and have a group photo with your parents as well as your uh, teachers. Moving on to board and superintendent communications, um, Mrs. Cracky. We'd like to extend condolences to the family of Miss Mary Ellen Dricky, 
This evening, Ms. Dricky served the OPS board from January 1st of 1997 to December 31st of 2012. She passed away July 30th. We thank, we are thankful for her service to the OPS board and ask that you please keep her family in your thoughts. Personally, I want to go on and acknowledge Mary Ellen because I served on the board with her. There probably wasn't anybody who did not have a mean bone in her body. That was Mary Ellen. And she had a sense of humor. And she knew so many people because she had experience in other things in the city. And I missed it when she was no longer able to communicate because it was always delightful talking to her. And we all loved her. Her schools loved her. She's such a nice person. And I want to acknowledge her and her family and because she was such an integral part of what we were doing at that time. So she is missed. Thank you. Moving on to Dr. Logan. Good evening, uh, President Snow and members of the board and those here in attendance and those watching uh, on via streaming. This past Thursday and Friday, we had our annual uh, New Teacher Institute and Leadership kickoffs at Baxter Arena. We welcomed nearly 400 new teachers into our OPS family, and we also welcomed back our district administrators, principals, and school leadership with some inspirational words from internationally renowned math guru, Dr. Dan Meyer. Dan taught math, taught high school students math who didn't particularly like math before he was their teacher. He actually has quite a few postings on iTunes University for those teachers uh, who may want to uh, see some of his work. He has advocated for better math instruction around the country. He earned his doctorate from Stanford University in math education as the chief academic officer at Desmos where he explores the future of math textbooks. And here's a hint, there aren't any textbooks. Uh, he has also been named one of Tech and Learning's three, uh, 30 leaders of the future. The leadership kickoff culminated with the announcement of this year's school swag winners. Congratulations to Davis Middle School Aviators and to the McMillan Magnet Middle School Monarchs. Although I do believe Tom Lee from uh, Northwest High School deserves uh, a bit of recognition as he brought his entire marching band as his swag. He just took it to another level and they just decided they can't compete with him anymore. Uh, both were selected by their peers and it's just a great way to start our school year uh, with um, school spirit uh, as we welcome back our youngsters uh, in a week or so. On Saturday, we, uh, I was privileged to attend along with our board president, uh, Mr. Snow and North High cheerleaders, the North High dance team and football players who represented Omaha Public Schools in the Native Omaha Days Parade. It's my first time participating and I appreciate uh, being invited to a, an event that is really for people who are native to Omaha. We had a great time as we walked the parade and uh, gave out, uh, I don't know, probably thousands of pieces of candy when I think about it, although we ran out. It was such a welcoming event and uh, we look forward this Saturday to the Back to School Bash that will be held at Baxter Arena. It's a Back to School Bash and Book Fair. We added uh, a literacy component this year. Uh, it's gotten so large and through a generous donation we are able to have it at the book fair and I will say several generous uh, donations from many sponsors. We are excited about the book fair and we'll be celebrating the nearly three million minutes to date as part of our summer reading program. Our students have been busily reading. We're not quite at three million but uh, remember that we changed the goal from one million to three million and I believe we're at like two million nine hundred thousand or so. So about that little hundred thousand we can certainly get that in a week. We'll welcome Star Wars characters, Batman, um, and we're Superman, and Superman, I like Superman, uh, Marvel heroes, and of course, Harry Potter and the crew. Please, uh, we look forward to everybody coming out. There will be lots of things that you can get, including uh, free t-shirts. Uh, there'll be uh, the Able One helicopter will be there. 
uh, and trinkets and community partners. I think we have over 40 community partners. Is that correct, Ms. Utterback? Thank you to Ms. Utterback and her team for uh, stepping it up uh, for year two for the uh, Fair. I don't know where we'll, if we'll have to have it at Memorial Stadium next year, but I don't, uh, it's actually gotten quite big. Uh, looking forward to Wednesday to the Mentor Recruitment Fair uh, on Wednesday from 11 to 2. The fair will give our employees an opportunity to learn how they can become a mentor. Dr. Tom Osborne of Team Mates and Deborah Neary, Executive Director of Mentor Nebraska, will be here uh, to, uh, this actually they're sponsoring the, the event in terms of Mentor Nebraska, and we are looking forward to uh, even more of our employees that are not school-based uh, to sign up to mentor, and of course school-based employees can sign up to mentor, but those who are, particularly, this is for particularly for those who are non-school-based and don't have a daily touch uh, with our young people. District readiness continues. We hold regular check-in meetings uh, to, to, to ensure we are set to go. August 14th is the first day of school. We have a transition day for students who are transitioning to uh, middle school for their first year in middle school, sixth graders, and also or fifth graders in the case of two of our schools, and three of our schools, rather. And then we also have uh, that for our ninth graders in all of our high schools. The call center uh, this Wednesday, our Student Transportation Call Center begins to take calls. We are having a uh, Facebook Live and Transportation, Mr. Travis Salas from Transportation will be uh, on Facebook Live with me on Friday, August the 9th from noon till 1 for you to ask questions live. We look forward to chatting with you. I really, really super, super enjoy those uh, along with uh, 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 Mr. Mr. Salas this time, it's his first time. We have a uh, congratulations to Xavier Herbert, who was accepted into uh, s uh, several Ivy League schools. Uh, he was also accepted into MIT and the California Institute of Technology. And uh, he, he's very excited about his career as a theoretical mathematician um, and conducting research on modern mathematical problems. He is a mathematics whiz. Very excited for Xavier, who has made the smart move to go to Boston and to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He is really off to a wonderful start. We welcome, it's awesome, we welcome uh, our new Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Scott Roberts. Mr. Roberts is a graduate of Burke High School. He also attended Beverage Middle School and Columbia yes. Elementary School. So we're excited to welcome him back to Omaha. We'll be transitioning with his family and uh, you should expect to see him uh, beginning in September. I also uh, always have to acknowledge the uh, fantastic work of uh, uh, Ms. Mrs. Courtney Bird, who has been our interim chief and served us extremely well during this year, uh, really helping us uh, unravel some particularly wicked uh, issues um, as it relates to the uh, budget. I don't have any other announcement at this time. I'm sorry, one more. Uh, OPS Business Marketing and Management Communication and Information and Health Supervisor, Delane Havlovic. Uh, he's right there in the first, second row, third row. Uh, Delane received a Best Award from the Nebraska Department of Education as its Nebraska Career Education Conference held in Kearney on, on, on the 5th of June. The award recognizes Mr. Havlovic's 20 years of service and involvement in professional associations, community, and school activities. He's extremely dedicated to career and technical uh, education and believes in the mission um, and it shows in everything that you do, uh, Mr. Havlovic. So thank you so much uh, for your service and congratulations on your recognition. <laughs> this concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Um, I skipped over the treasurer's port, so Mrs. Bird. Board President Snow, Superintendent Dr. Logan, members of the board, the financial statements for the period ended June 30th, 2019 have been finalized and uploaded for your review. Thank you. Moving on to board members, Ms. Snipe. Thank you, Mark. Um, as the president of the South Omaha Neighborhood Alliance, I wanted to take a moment again to thank Dr. Logan for attending our 2019 annual South Omaha Banquet. Um, some may be wondering, well, what does that have to do with OPS? But as a neighborhood leader, um, especially when it comes to South Omaha Neighborhood Associations, which we're very strong with, we recognize that when um, neighborhoods and communities are supported, our children are supported. And all of the monies that are raised by that banquet are invested into South Omaha neighborhoods. So I did want to take a time 
time to thank her for that and also to encourage anyone um, to check and see if you do have neighborhood association in your area. Um, as a neighborhood association leader, we are definitely going to be partnering more with the elementary schools in our neighborhoods. But I also want to take a moment to invite everyone to attend National Night Out tomorrow. Um, it's a nationwide um, event. It's done to really support positive relationships between the police and the community. Uh, we will be celebrating Highland South Indian Hill at Upland Park, which is by the Croc Center. Um, it's a very large event. It's one that we're very proud of. We'll have about 20 organizations there represented to provide resources to the neighborhood as well. So they're celebrating all over Omaha, Nebraska. So if you have nothing to do tomorrow, just try to step out and have a little fun. And if you have nowhere to go, come to Upland Park in South Omaha between 5 and 7.30. We'll have free food, fun, games, and plenty to do. Thank you. Thank you. It is an awesome event. I've attended before. Any other comments from the board? Mr. Perlman. Just briefly, I want to do speak a little bit about the mandatory reporting policy that the district has. It's policy number four, 5402. It's a policy that I've uh, wanted changed now for almost a year. And uh, tonight I handed out a revised policy to the uh, entire board. Uh, I think it's been six or seven years since this policy was last revised and it was done in consultation with county attorneys in both Douglas and Sarpy County. Um, the statute uh, that talks about mandatory reporting in Nebraska is 28711. Uh, one thing missing from that statute is a time requirement. So about six or seven years ago, the county attorneys met with uh, officials from Omaha Public Schools and drafted a policy which implemented a, a time requirement. It was an effort to strengthen the mandatory reporting policy in OPS. Unfortunately, uh, I think that it's currently uh, being used uh, to criticize the policy of mandatory reporting in OPS. And I think that criticism is misplaced. I think that OPS did what it should have done when it was revised last time. Uh, it reached out to the parties that it should have reached out to. Uh, it went above and beyond what the statute calls for. Uh, but now some of the criticism that I'm seeing against the policy that OPS has for mandatory reporting, I believe is misplaced. The 24 hour requirement to report child abuse was an effort to make sure that it was done in a timely manner, not to give a grace period. It's now being confused as a grace period. In no way did OPS ever intend to have a grace period to report child abuse. So I looked at 28 711 and I looked at the policy that OPS drafted and I've revised it myself because I've waited almost a year to have it revised and I can't wait any longer. So I'm asking the board to put it on the agenda the next board meeting we have in two weeks and just pass it. It comports with the law. If you read 28 711 it requires to report child abuse to the proper law enforcement agency or to HHS. You can do it over the phone to HHS's toll free child and abuse hotline or you can call police. That's what the law requires and that's what our policy should say. Our practices and procedures should go into more detail and I think it's already done. I commend Dr. Logan for the training that she's implemented since she's been superintendent to make sure that all staff know the requirements of the statute and the mandatory reporting law. And I know that other things are being done to make sure that these sorts of things are reported as quickly as they can possibly be reported. But our policies need to reflect that and so I don't want to wait any longer to pass this policy and so I just wanted to make everyone aware that that policy has now been given to everyone on the board and that with school starting very shortly there's no reason to wait any longer to pass this policy it's in everyone's best interest and hopefully we can get that done in two weeks thank you thank you mr. Perlman um, I will make sure that this gets on the chair's agenda for the policy committee um, and we'll go from there. Any other comments? All right, so there is no uh, public comment today. Um, on the consent agenda, I-10, consulting service agreement between Omaha Public Schools and Prism Advisors has been pulled and moved to J-1B, if I'm correct, um, as an action item. All right, I will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda that is before us. Move, so move. Second. There's a motion on the floor by Mr. Smith, second by Mrs. Cracky. 
Any abstentions? Hearing none, roll call, please. Holman? Aye. Cracky? Aye. Perlman? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Smith? Aye. Snipe? Aye. Snow? Aye. Seven aye. Motion carries. Moving on to our first action item, J1A. And I believe our presenters. I believe it will be Jacobs, Mark Summers, and uh, the architects. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ray. I'm good evening. President good evening. Snow, Vice President Logan, <coughs> Dr. Logan. Uh, tonight we have a request of the board uh, to move forward with uh, the two high schools that we've been working on for uh, a little over two years if we go all the way back to start some initial programming. So I'm just, uh, they've, they've promised, I promised I'd stay to a quick introduction. Um, we've got Susan Christofferson here today, of course, uh, Director of Secondary Education. Uh, she's going to talk a little bit about the process and approach that we've used to date on the design uh, to give the board a good understanding of the engagement at the curricular level which is really the seed of all of these spaces that end up in the building the building is just a result of that process so she's going to talk to that a little bit and then we have a representative from each uh, architectural firm that's going to do an overview of the building plan uh, and some of the uh, exterior of each campus we're going to try to hold each one to about five minutes work through that presentation and then of course we'll answer any questions that you folks might have at the end Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, as Mark said, we actually began several years ago. It actually began in fall of 2017. Um, but the work really focused in after the bond passed, so the fall of 2018. All of our work has really focused around five principles, which is being adaptive, efficient, engaging, future ready and imaginative. Those were the principles that drove every conversation we had as we were developing what this, what these two schools could potentially be. Um, I just want to say that both firms, both DLR and BCDM have been very responsive, thoughtful, creative, and great listeners as we as curriculum teaching and learning consultants at have come into conversations and have brought ideas forward based on things that we've had a chance to see in other schools, other school districts, other states. We would say, can we think about this? And before we know it, they would come up to the next meeting with a solution or a possibility to just continue to expand our thinking. And for that, we're very grateful. Um, each teaching and learning consultant has been involved very actively in this conversation, sorry, um, in addressing and sharing classroom standards based on their content needs, high visibility lab spaces to engage students. Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but each area, this is just a sample design standards for school art facilities. We've taken what those standards are and make sure that those are part of the work that's happening within our schools. Um, the the conversation and the communication has been very constant with the work that's happening. As you can see from my stack over here, that's all of the communication back and forth from looking at locker room spaces. How do we address supervision and safety? Those types of conversations to sight lines down the hallway to ensuring what we are delivering in our classrooms will be a comprehensive experience but at the same time knowing that education continues to change and evolve and how do we make sure that our spaces can do the same so that we're not limited to the confines of a box and so with that I'm going to let them take on to explain both of the facilities and if I can answer more questions later please let me know one quick question before you sure. sit down um, Susan is um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what you uh, learned uh, from your perspective, a curriculum perspective, from the visits that several of us made uh, to uh, Kansas uh, to see uh, current high schools that are uh, yes. been recently built. 
Um, that experience was very eye-opening, um, to say the least. What we were able to see is such collaborative spaces, and I don't, I'm sure both of them will speak to it, but we saw a decentralized administration. We saw administration that was out in the academic part of the school and engaging in, in different ways. We saw students in collaboration spaces working on projects. We saw teachers collaborating and working on different areas of interdisciplinary or helping to support students. The whole facility itself is just a back and forth sense of collaboration and engagement. And that was what we were looking for as we started to build and think about what this could possibly be for our students in these schools. We also were very cognizant of the fact that we have schools that were built in 1924 in OPS. So how do we possibly take some of that innovation, so go back to being adaptive and efficient, engaging, future ready and imaginative, how can we take those spaces that might be in one of the, our current buildings and make it happen there? And both firms graciously worked with us and created those spaces at Northwest, Burke, South, and Bryan, and the teachers have been so responsive about the possibilities of what that can look like. And it just really is some tweaking and making sure that we are presenting it in a whole way to the new principal of the building, to the teachers of the building about what these collaboration areas can look like. Did that? Yeah. Okay. Very exciting. Test this out here. Good evening. My name is Aaron Pearson. I'm a principal with DLR Group and an architect leading our team in design of uh, the new high school at 60th and L Street. Just a brief project overview for you here. 60th and L Street School is located on approximately 40 and a half acres, the northeast corner of 60th and L Street. The overall area for the building is projected to be about 285,000 square feet and will serve 1,500 students. We're designing to a program budget of just under $92.5 million, and we're on schedule to open for the 2022-2023 school year. On the screen is a site plan showing the 60th and L site. To uh, give us a little orientation, north is at the top of the screen, west ironically is at the east side of the screen, and east at the west side of the screen. Hopefully that doesn't confuse you too much. The site can be accessed from both 60th Street and from L Street right here on the south side of the site. We've got a through road that goes around the perimeter of the site. One of the challenges we faced with this project is uh, this site has quite a bit of grade to it. And uh, we've uh, taken an approach that uh, utilizes the grade and maximizes uh, the site utilization, uh, designing with various programmatic elements uh, in various plateaus that gradually rise in height throughout the site, starting with practice fields in the southwest corner, moving up just slightly to softball and baseball fields, and then to a track that surrounds a football baseball field, and finally, the bleachers seating that looks over the track and the football soccer field um, brings us up to the main level where the building is located. We have visitor parking to the south, to the east, and to the north of the building, conveniently located near the entrances. We also have planned area for expansion at the north and at the east. The lowest level of our building has walkout access to the outdoor athletic fields. It includes two gymnasiums, locker rooms, and space for the JROTC program. The main level of the building has three entrances, one on the north, one on the east, and one on the south. Each entrance feeds into a centrally located cafeteria. The north portion of this building 
features administration. And I should note that this is the main administration area, but we do have the decentralized administration concept. So as we go through and we look at the academic wing, there will be um, at least two principals or activities directors on each level of the building. We have a shelf space for a uh, program that has yet to be defined. It's uh, sometimes been discussed that this could be a community health center. Uh, this could also be a space for future laboratories, uh, but right now it's a shell space waiting to be defined. Space. Sorry about that. Sorry. Right here in the corner of the building. From our commons, we have access to uh, the top loading gymnasium, wrestling and fitness spaces, career academies that look out onto our gymnasium, great exposure there food service, and music and drama. A centrally located two-level media center connects the north portion of the building to the south academic wing. Just circle that academic wing there. This wing includes approximately 30 classrooms, along with another career academy Art rooms, science labs, and breakout spaces adjacent to the classrooms and corridors that will serve as additional classroom space for both small and large group collaboration. I'll just point out these breakout spaces. You can probably see it better on your handouts, but we've got classrooms that line the perimeter. And these open areas next to each classroom on either side of the building are the breakout spaces for that collaboration. point out also, we've got uh, offices adjacent to that collaboration for decentralized uh, administration. The second level of the classroom wing is similar to the first, but this level includes a bridge that brings the academic wing back over to our north wing to a stairway and elevator that connect to the commons, improving on circulation. Mm -hmm. On this bridge, we've got our teacher planning centers. And we've got wide open spaces adjacent to the planning centers where we see um, a, these spaces being extremely conducive to casual faculty and faculty student collaboration. There is a third level. Uh, the floor plate is uh, nearly identical to the first two levels. Finally, here's a proposed rendering of what the new 60th and Isle High School could look like. I will uh, caution you that not all materials have been finalized in their location and selection, uh, but they will include uh, durable OPS approved materials of brick, metal panel, and uh, glazing. I see a question. I'm willing to entertain that now or after uh, my colleague has a chance to present. I'm glad I just saw the last slide. I have not seen any parking on the other two entrances. Can you show us that? Absolutely. That's always an extremely important part of these yes, buildings. It is. And uh, the site uh, really worked out quite nicely. Um, pointing out, this is L Street. Coming up from the south, we've got uh, what we're labeling as staff and visitor parking. This has yet to be determined that serve this south entrance going to the commons. We've got a bus drop-off area and additional parking that serve the east entrance. And to the north, we've got student parking that uh, basically wraps the building. Thank you. Yes. Uh, certainly willing to entertain more questions, but uh, right now I can uh, turn it over to my colleague, Pat Carson. Uh, who is here to present on the school at 156th and Ida. Thank you, Aaron. So again, my name is Pat Carson. I'm a uh, principal and architect with BCDM Architects here in Omaha. Uh, here to talk to you tonight about the 156th and Ida location. Uh, quite a bit of what I'm going to cover is probably very similar to what you just heard Aaron say, uh, because the primary components of both buildings are very similar. Uh, in terms of uh, the numbers, uh, the site of the Ida Street location is not quite twice as large 
as the 60th and L location at 72 acres. Uh, 315,000 square feet. I want to point out that about 30,000 of those square feet apply to the YMCA and pool. So again, as the high school itself is concerned, the square footage of both uh, facilities are, are uh, very similar. Uh, again, 1,500 students. Again, a budget of 92 million, as you saw uh, previously, and the same opening date of fall of 2022. So as we look at the site for 156th and Ida, North is up, and uh, Ida Street, I'm sorry, Ida Street runs here along the bottom, uh, and 156th runs to the top. Uh, you'll see the area, it's sort of an oddly shaped site. The darker area is the OPS property. You'll see that uh, per the city, we created a circular access road to connect to I Iowa Street, which uh, they just uh, built a gas station there for reference uh, as you drive past the site and 159th Street, which takes you back into Stone Creek. Uh, the building sits at the highest point of the site. Uh, it is a two-story scheme. When I get into the plan, I'll show you that. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, as orientation goes on the site, the play fields that you see on the northern part of the site are all of the play fields that support the high school. And these other fields that you see on the southern uh, side of the circular road are placeholders for fields for the YMCA purposes. Uh, again, from a parking point of view, Again, we have, uh, we have several lots here. There's a parent drop-off lane here at the middle of the site, and within it would uh, proposedly be uh, staff parking as well as YMCA parking, uh, and then student parking on either end. Uh, the building does have several exit locations around the building. The thought is that everyone, though, would try to enter through a common uh, location centralized in the building. So whether you're coming by your own vehicle, being dropped off by a parent, coming by a bus, everybody comes to the same entry point of the building. Uh, when I show you the floor plan, you'll see that the entry point for the high school and the YMCA are co-located, but I want to make sure everybody understands they are separate. So when you enter into the high school, you do not enter into the YMCA and vice versa. As far as the floor plan goes, again, that entry point here is centralized in the middle. Um, as we work around, uh, to echo a lot of what Aaron had said from 60th and L Street, we also have the primary administration area adjacent to that entry, but we have uh, broken out additional administrative zones, counseling here at the center of the building on the first floor, and a teacher planning center across the, the aisle from it. Uh, again, as I mentioned, this is a two-story scheme. When we get to the second floor, you'll see there's another teacher planning center on second floor. Uh, sort of work my ways uh, clockwise around from the entry. We have uh, music and performing arts here uh, next to the administrative area, uh, the black box and theater components as we move further to the north. This sort of boomerang shaped element here is the classroom wing. Uh, the northern side of it are the more typical classrooms while the lab and specialized instruction spaces are on the southern end. Uh, as we come back to the center of the building, we get the cafeteria with kitchen and support spaces behind it. The blue spaces that you see here are activity areas of the building, including the JLRTC. Again, two gymnasiums, as you saw at 60th and L, and locker rooms. Uh, here at the, sort of hard to see, but it's a light blue color. That's the YMCA space, including the pool. So we go up to the second floor. Oops. Uh, again, the, it's, it's very, very similar in terms of the academic side of the building. Uh, you'll see, again, collaboration spaces, uh, as you saw at 60th and L, occur at both ends on both floors of the classroom wing of the building. Uh, there's a media center that's open to uh, the circulation areas that's located here at the hub of the second floor. That media center has good visibility from both the main entry, from the cafeteria, and from the classroom spaces to the north. Again, uh, as an exterior element, uh, I would say the same thing that Aaron said, which is this is where we're at right now. It is the same palette of materials for 60th and L Street and 156th and Ida, that being primarily brick, metal panel, and glass uh, as exterior materials, uh, and those pieces are being developed. So with that. One other, one other element I just wanted to mention too was on the safety and security of the building. So. Uh, not only have we had a lot of internal reviews with the design experts on material selection and placement of glass in line of sight, there's also a, an independent third party, a security expert 
uh, that we've been consulting with. They've performed plan reviews. They've also been in conversations about what's the operation of the building going to look like, and is it just an SRO and a resource officer? What are those folks doing in the building? So we've been working with uh, Donnie Morrison and folks on the district side making sure that the design supports the operation from a security and safety perspective not really the, the other way around it's just like curriculum however you're going to operate uh, the safety protocol we want the building to support that so we've had a, a lot of really good discussions on that um, and really down into the the specifics again of line of sight not only internally to the building but externally how do cars approach the site uh, can folks see them uh, well in advance card reader systems, all those other things uh, that will go into both of these buildings as well. So I just wanted to mention that from a safety and security perspective, that that's been a priority of the designs as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sidebar. Actually, we were elaborating on your conversation. Um, so open up for questions from the board. Mr. Perlman. Thank you. Does the uh, new school in West Omaha have career academy space? Yes, it does. Okay. And what's envisioned for those spaces? We are still in exploration, so and they're adaptable. So we're looking at some innovation lab space, which could be VEX robotics, mechatronics. Um, we're looking at a dental program. We're kind of a variety of things that we're looking at for both of the buildings right now to what best fits the needs for our current status in the Omaha area. So they're under exploration. Yeah. I'll kind of, I can go, kind of go through that with you, uh, uh, with all board members. Uh, I have uh, asked for uh, the team to uh, create a um, large data room that uh, will be completed by the end of September of looking at all programming uh, for all high, for all current seven high schools before we look at what we're going to add uh, with these two new high schools to see whether or not some of our current programming um, has um, needs to sunset. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to add uh, different programming in our current high schools, uh, along with the um, adding the programs, adding the two new high schools and what programming will go into that. So we're taking a complete comprehensive look. So that is due by the end of September. And then, <laughs> no pressure, <laughs> but they already know, so this is not a news, but we uh, discussed it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and, then, uh, and then between September and April will be working with a national uh, expert in this area um, who will help us uh, determine what, are the, what the programs are. Obviously, we'll use information from our chamber, and this is a part of our strategic planning, and that's why we align the kind of the timeline. Uh, and then in uh, April, be ready to make some programmatic decisions that will feed up into our student assignment plan. We realize that it's uh, very important for families to know and be able to make choices about what the, uh, um, what the options will be. We also know that uh, you know, equity is very important to all of us here, um, especially the Board of Education, and that we uh, cannot just add programming into new schools. We need to think about our existing schools and looking at the outcomes of those programs, for example, graduation rates based on uh, student where students are, uh, what where students are, we have more applications where students really desire uh, programs. So looking at the entire um, district uh, programming for high school, similarly we'll be looking at some of our middle school programming that could potentially feed up or, or be supports for our high school programming before we add uh, programs here, but we have a initial September to start looking at the data, and then in April to start making, uh, giving us about six months or so to start making some programmatic decisions before, well before our strategic, uh, sorry, well, well before our deadline for the student assignment plan, which is really October of 2020, uh, where well we would need to have those decisions so the board. Uh, can ma uh, can assist us in making the best uh, recommendation for our student assignment plan. Mrs. Cracky. I'm going back to the parking again. The reason I'm doing that 
is it for years and years, Catlin's parking lot has been very far from the front door that you had to walk around to get into. So that's what I want to be able to see, that people who park there aren't going to walk blocks and blocks to get into the main part of the building. And that's a challenge, I know. But it's, as long as we're doing it, we might as well do that. Sure, let me just go back and clarify that a little bit. I mentioned how the goal is to have everyone come to a, a central point, but that is not the only point. If, if the staff principal decides to bring them in, we have other entry points here, 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 that also touch the parking lot area. So if it was inclement weather or something, they, they would have access to something that's much closer. Will they be able to get in there, or will they still be encouraged to go around to the front? That's really going to be an operational question for the building. Um, we, we're, we're trying to make sure that the designs provide flexibility of operations. Um, on the 60th and L Street site, there are multiple entrances that could be utilized. They all come to the same exact point to con kind of control that flow of people, whether it's public coming in for an athletic event or staff coming in or students. And at, at the 156 and Ida Street site, just because of the, the building orientation, a lot of that happens at the very front and people can be easily funneled to that. But there are ample parking spaces kind of around the building and depending on how the campus wants to or the district wants wants to kind of manage and secure those different entryways, that's a decision that they'll have to make. Again, the designs will support either approach. Ms. Strachey, we um, have um, their secured entry in all of these buildings, and we would be encouraging our students to go around to use the secured entry point uh, for the purposes of security. They may have to walk extra. Students who uh, might need to park closer because of, uh, uh, of a concern or a disability, they would have uh, preferred parking spaces anyway, so they would be able to park close. Uh, but all of our other uh, healthy high schoolers or students who are non-disabled, rather, uh, would be able to uh, walk around to that secured entry point. It's a security uh, a concern, and we've also added secured entries um, because that's the best, um, according to our security consultants who work with us, that is the safest way to make sure that students uh, uh, can enter safely and that we can have eyes on students or other sta uh, folks who come in um, uh, for that. Similarly, at the 156th and Ida uh, location where we will have the co-location of the YMCA, uh, there was initially a plan uh, to have a more uh, free-flowing uh, entry for both together and we all collectively decided using our parent hats and kind of a little commonsensical that it was going to be uh, important for the um, for us to have separate and secure entry. I know we had Mr. Perlman um, brought that up as a concern and we share that with you so we do have uh, separate entry. Uh, uh, they're, they're housed uh, adjacent but there is separate entry for the high school and for the Y uh, MCA uh, to ensure that we have a safe entry for our students and safe entry for our Y patrons for the Y patrons as well. Dr. Holman. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, last I knew, um, the 60th and L site would have the elevated gym, and that just wasn't mentioned tonight. I just want to confirm that that is still in the, where the uh, top loading. Okay, That's top correct. loading. Okay, That's perfect. Correct. Thank you. For, for folks on the board, the top loading gym is the one that where you can, um, I'm not going to describe it well, but you, 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 you can, you can kind of enter from the top and there's a track around the, uh, and that the, on, the only high school that will feature that is the 60th and L site. Um, if I'm, I'm going to get, I hope I think I get this right, I'm going to um, repeat Mr. Summer. Uh, the, uh, the way that the grading is at the 156th and Ida, it did not, um, allow for uh, a top loading gym, so there's no top loading gym at 156th and Ida. Exactly. Mr. Perlman. Thank you. A uh, couple questions about 60th and L. I drive by there every day on my way to work, so I know that the west side, um, if there's going to be activity fields there, there's going to be a challenge with drainage. What's being done to uh, make sure that those fields aren't flooded all the time? That's why we've got good civil engineers to begin with. Uh, but uh, drainage is a challenge, and uh, we have a series of retention ponds uh, around the site 
I believe there is, and retention pond is basically an underground way of filtering, filtering water, uh, but uh, two of our major ones would be in this south area right here, and then uh, uh, over on the north side of the site where the uh, grade flows into uh, another, in the opposite direction. And let me let me add a little bit, uh, uh, Mr. Perlman, Board Member Perlman. The the site, as you know it too, will change quite a bit from a contours perspective. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. There's quite a bit of fill right at that corner that kind of ends on 60th and L. Um, the virtual school was there. You could enter that building. That site's going to come up about 20 or 30 feet. And so, from a, a, a watershed perspective, all of this stuff is reviewed with the City of Omaha, and they have very spe specific requirements of what the district can and can't not do from a watershed perspective, how much you need to store on site so it doesn't cause um, uh, poor conditions to utilities downstream. But all of that, the contouring of both sites, uh, largely changes to make sure that those types of issues are not there. If you look at the football stadiums uh, for the two different schools, it looks like the West Omaha school has uh, stands on both sides and the 60th Street does not can we just get a little more information on what's going on there I, but both of them will th there's a little bit of review going on is do, do we need to have them on both or one but they will be the same and then they're both master planned for expansion in the future uh, so part of it is we're finishing some final conversations with with athletics to really understand um, because these won't be uh, uh, Friday night football competition uh, fields out of the gate. What is the right uh, amount of bleachers to support the folks that will come for uh, uh, soccer games or for junior varsity? But um, they will be identical from that perspective. Okay, my final uh, comment is a comment and not a question. I'm going to have to vote no for these uh, <clears throat> schematic designs. They're just so far apart in, in what I'm seeing that if we're going to be a board that's interested in equity, this isn't something that, that I can support. Um, I'm looking at the West Omaha design. I have it right in front of me here, and it's it's beautiful. There's Florida ceiling windows. There's you know, there's the, what appears to be some sort of woodwork overhanging the, the windows, a, a huge atrium uh, building flows out to a, a landscaped uh, 90 acres. And um, when I compare that to the South Omaha design, it just, I don't have any words for it. It's just industrial, institutional, uninviting. And I'm not going to pay lip service to equity. I, you know, I'm sorry. I know we're far along the line in, in, in the design, and but I'm going to have to just oppose it. So. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Anybody else have any questions or comments? Okay. Um, so you said projected opening. Is that all grade levels, or is that just ninth and tenth grade? That. It would it would be grades uh, nine and ten. So those are students who are currently in the fifth and the sixth grade. Okay, um, and I just wanted to make sure that that was still the plan. Um, if we go to the 60th and L site, <clears throat> so this area, like Mr. Perlman said, is very. I think it's one of the busiest areas in the city, uh, just for people to get to the heart of South Omaha. If I live in the neighborhood across the street right now, there's no crosswalk for me to get to the school. If the school is going to build, be built higher on a layer, I can't get to that school. To the to to what direction? To the 60th and out. So if I'm on the south side of L Street and I have to walk, mm -hmm. there's no crossing. I would have to go all the way to that intersection down there to try to cross, and you're still going to be blocked off. I mean, so with this design are we going to work with the city or as a school district we are to figure in the out process how to of working with the city allow for those both, kids that are um, a mile apart to walk 60th to school oh sorry You're i good. interrupted you You're we're good. in the process of working both on 60th street improvements and l street improvements uh some of those improvements um I think address uh, some of your pedestrian concerns. Uh, there will be new signalized intersections up here at what I believe is Hillsdale. Uh, and then there'll be another. There's no neighborhoods up there, though. I'm talking about like down where yes, those neighborhoods are. There will be south another side. signalized intersection okay. uh, at the south 
um, and at the intersection of 60th and L Street um, okay. to uh, better facilitate uh, both pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Because you have a lot of the semis that go through there and you also have STA busing over there and then our busing comes through over there. That just, to me, the only, my big concern is if I have to walk. I, I just think of a lot of kids in South Omaha that have to walk to school and their biggest concern is do I have a sidewalk and Absolutely. is it safe? Um, okay. And there, the, both, both sites on the entire perimeters will have city approved sidewalk and access. So not only from, uh, uh, from, from an adjacent neighborhood perspective, but also from an accessibility and ADA mm -hmm. perspective as well for as far as slopes and grades. That's good. Uh, and, and my final question with the, so how many stalls are gonna be at the 60th and L site? And the reason why I bring this up just in context, South High has parking, student parking, sorry. What is it? Stall, Stall I mean, bathroom. parking stalls, not bathroom stalls, I apologize, <laughs> a long day. Um, so I have kids that are students I work with at South High uh, and they have to park at Walgreens, which is not even on their site, right? And Walgreens is generous enough not to tow their car. However, on this, if I'm a student in that parking lot's park, I mean packed, there's no parking. What's where these students are gonna park or are they gonna start parking and it just seems like it's gonna get very congested. We're uh, just shy of 600 stalls, which is a few hundred beyond code required and we've got master plan for uh, additional parking along uh, this road that connects to 60. Oh that's Street. perfect that was just that's a hits the nail on the head because yeah. the worst thing ever is I would yeah. think for those students is when oh, you're absolutely. late to school every day and you can't find a parking spot. And yeah. we talked about this uh, briefly earlier and I believe uh, the other site has about a hundred more stalls that serve the YMCA. That's correct. Correct. Do we know if the the city's going to be working with us, not the city, but map busing on making short routes or loop there for students that want to catch That's something we need to follow up on. I don't believe we've had those conversations with, uh, with those folks at this point in time, but it is something we can definitely follow up on. Perfect. I mean, that would help with students that have to walk. Um, I know we can't do it as much in Bellevue for Brian, but I think that'll, you know. Mrs. Cracky. That was a good question. And I want to follow up on it and say, we've been there and been there and been there with this before about all of that. So I hope that that gets settled or taken care of or looked at so we don't see it because it's not fun. Thank you. Ms. Snipe. Um, I remember going to one of the neighborhood meetings you had over there. Maybe if you could just refresh my memory about what's going to happen with the street on 60th as far as the people who live in the neighborhood on the west side of 60th so those are that's Ralston school district on the west side of 60th. there's something about being able to only turn one way yep yep so uh, currently there is a, a light at the kind of the crest of the hill which is Hillsdale uh, we've worked with the city to be able to move that light south one block okay. and in order to do that and provide what they call turn queuing uh, the city's requiring a median be placed and so that will restrict some left-hand turns out of that neighborhood unless you're at that signal so uh, historically they can left-hand turn on Hillsdale that will come south one block but we did have uh, a kind of a, a, a neighborhood community meeting if you will and then a larger community meeting to specifically talk about the public improvements uh, and how they affect the community to the west there and also specifically the homeowner straight to the north because they're in a little bit of a unique uh, situation uh, along 60th on the east side uh, so we've, we've had individual meetings on those uh, changes again per the city's requirements and then we've had larger discussions where the city has attended and helped answer those questions about number of cars and again the safe way to make sure uh, not only students can access and staff and, and other folks access the building but how to keep the community safe as well when there is kind of an increase of traffic in those areas okay and then just I would be remiss if I did not mention that I noticed the difference in those pictures as well when I looked at it. Um, as a graduate of Bryan, that's one of the things that always bothered me was just that very institutional look of the school. And when you look at the school on 156th and Ida versus the 160th and L, there is a pretty large difference. Um, so I want to specify that I noticed that. And then I'm wondering, um, 
When I look at the different color codes uh, for 156th and Ida in the school, we talk about administration, aquatics, et cetera. Are these the different programs then that are in the school? I'm aware that there's probably some flexibility with that, but I, again, see differences with that as well. So I'm just wondering. So I, I think some of that, um, if, if there is any difference, it's just purely in the name. We've, we've walked through both campuses and counted the number of classrooms and the types of spaces. Uh, we've had specific uh, meetings to make sure, again, there was, uh, if, if this type of innovation lab showed up at 60th and L, and from a square footage perspective, uh, what does 156 and I to have as a comparable? We want to make sure the square footage is, is uh, very, very similar. Again, they are uh, two unique facilities, so layout and location of those are going to vary depending on the flow of the building. Uh, but from a, a space to space, we wanted to make sure uh, that the users and, and uh, Susan's team has the ultimate flexibility of kind of deciding what those programs will be inside of the spaces. But both campuses have uh, the same from a count perspective. Thank you. Well, thank you, oh, Dr. Holman. I'm sorry. Um, just kind of piggybacking. Um, off of Mr. Perlman and Ms. Snipes as far as like the outside aesthetics because they are correct in saying that at least in my opinion that there is a significant difference um, in at least the way the outside looks when you compare both buildings. Um, is there a way I mean it, will the 60th and L site and I haven't been over that way so I'm not certain how it all will look but the 156th site has a lot of greenery, a lot of trees planted, and so forth. I mean, so just from the pictures itself, it looks a lot more inviting, right? As compared to the um, 60th and L site, will there be trees planted? Is there going to be anything added to the school to make it look more welcoming? Um, yes, I, I think specific to trees, I want to say uh, what the contractor is carrying to plant right now is like five or 600 trees. Uh -huh. And part of the, the tree uh, requirement is any trees that are disturbed from a canopy perspective at either site have to be replaced at like a two to one ratio. So from a landscaping perspective uh, and, a, and a plantings perspective, there'll be an abundance of those of, of kind of varying sizes, but specifically trees, there's, a, there's several hundred that are planned to be planted uh, at, at uh, both locations. Thank you. And I think it would be helpful for um, uh, the board to see um, in the next iteration of the renderings uh, similar out similar exterior finishes. Sure. Because that is really it's, it's been it's if I look at it as well because the finishes I know the finishes haven't been decided. But because the renderings have different finishes, it certainly is going to, and because we, and some of us visited, so we saw what different finishes can do to how the, 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 the building feels, you know, uh, from, uh, from how you uh, enter. Uh, so I think that that would be helpful to have just similar finishes. I know that we are looking at different, because we have different size properties here. There's not any, so it won't matter how many trees we plant, at a 40 acre site versus a 77 acre site, there's just gonna be more trees because there's more land. Um, so if we could see, I think that would be very helpful to the, to the board to see um, uh, uh, renderings that have just similar finishes, whether it's gonna be them. The wood is very inviting. Um, it's soft uh, um, and it, it just seems more of the moment. Um, I think that would be that would be uh, helpful. Um, even if the other one, even if the, um, um, whatever we decide so that we can really see uh, exterior finishes that, that, look, uh, that look and feel similar. I also think too in the renderings, uh, because of the way that uh, they are positioned, we can't, I know that the 60th and L site has a lot of glass, but we can't see it on this rendering. Um, and so that is uh, something that uh, could be helpful as well to help the, the board be able to see that um, where the glass is low. I can see it on here, um, but most of that is based on the fact that I've did some visiting. Um, so that could be helpful as well uh, uh, to, the, to the Board of Education. Thank you. And, and also 60th and L would sit on a hill, so you would actually see it as mm -hmm. you come up on. So I there's there's actually, in, in the site contour we talked about, there's work being done to uh, 
even make that more prominent is, is from a line of sight perspective. Uh -huh. As you're moving uh, eastbound up L Street off to your left, there's kind of that hill now. That's going to get brought down again so you have better line of sight to the front of 60th and L building. That would be good because that entire area over there is very industrial. <laughs> uh, and on sidewalks again, uh, I was just thinking there are five fast food restaurants around that 60th and L school within walking distance. I don't know any of our high school that have that many restaurants around them. So you're already gonna have kids running across the street. Uh, so that's just something to take into consideration. I know Brian has a convenience store, Central doesn't have anything, North has a couple, but when you think of it, right across the street, Taco John, all that stuff. If I'm a student, after school I'm running across the street. So there, there will be a signal. We, we've met with those uh, business owners mm -hmm. to make sure that they understand what's happening, of course, across the street. But it also is going to change their access road. Okay. Currently, there's two approaches out of the, the Wendy's is no longer there, but Taco yeah. John's and uh, Village Inn, et cetera. That's going to change a bit to kind of narrow that and, and give us a controlled access Perfect. across with another signal. Um, so they're extremely excited about the high school coming yeah. across the street, of course. They're excited but we wanted now. to make sure they understood <laughs> it is going to change <laughs> some infrastructure and access to their site. Uh, it'll give them, it'll make it easier for folks to come to their business as well because it'll be on a signal now. So that's um, good. That, that's good to know. Thank you. Um, that, that's a good suggestion. Um, would you guys be interested in, as a board, uh, this is from Dr. Logan, uh, moving this action item to the next board meeting so we can get some actual renderings uh, to make people miss Cracky? At some point in the process, in the past, board members have had their lunch and boarded a bus and with World Herald and everybody else on the bus, we journeyed out to some of those places as they were in the process and it gave us a really good understanding and feel of it and it's something we should all probably be seeing but not everybody can get to all those spots but it was really a very enjoyable time i like doing that well, i think we can do a site and they had us put a hard hat later. on too yeah. yeah field trip that's i think i think people could do that uh i think that would that be real no, that, it's not going to adjust the range, board, but too. that's something we can do later as the sites yeah, get more developed. We have a beautiful bus out in front of the building we could take. All right. Um, so everyone, on, you guys are in agreement. Are you okay with me moving this item um, from action, and we'll do it at the next board meeting? Yeah. What... what um, from a project schedule perspective, what we're trying to work towards is setting building footings in September. Uh, so, so tonight, if there was a deviation from uh, approving kind of the total package, we'd like for the board to at least approve the footprint. We can work on building elevation materials and changing colors, but we're, we're just from a timeline perspective and a kind of a critical path of making sure the footings get in the ground in time so work can continue on throughout the, the winter. So um, if there is a way to motion to at least approve the plan, not the elevation, I think that's something that we can really work with. Beyond that, uh, we'd have to convene a little bit. Is that fair? So I changed my, I didn't know that. So we don't want to, I don't want to delay that. So um, we could, I'm taking back the suggestion of moving back to the next meeting. Um, because if we push that back, it would, it would delay the opening of the school for a year. Um, yes. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Just to be uh, clear, I just um, that that was why I asked you the question um, mm -hmm. uh, here because I'm a, a, we, I know we needed to get it on this board meeting. Uh, the thing that I would just we want to commit to is just to make sure that we would have those uh, prior to the next board meeting so that mm -hmm. um, everyone will feel comfortable with the vote that they made this evening. Correct. Thank you. All right. So the motion on the. Uh, I will entertain a motion to approve J1A as um, in front of us right now. So moved. 
There's a motion on the floor by Mr. Smith. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Ryan. Any discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Cracky? Aye. Perlman? Nope. Ryan? Aye. Smith? Aye. Snipe? Aye. Snow? Aye. Holman? Aye. Six aye. Motion carries. Moving on to item J1B. This item was pulled from the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Perlman? Thank you, Mr. President. I will be voting in favor of this contract, but I wanted to pull it just to make a statement that in the future, I hope to get more information about um, the costs associated with these sorts of contracts. I'm, I'm confident hearing from Dr. Logan this week that this is money well spent, um, but just in the future, I want to be able to see a little bit more information before supporting these sorts of things. That's all, thanks. Thank you. Um, I'll entertain a motion to approve item J1B. So moved. There's motion, there's motion on the floor by Dr. Holman, is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Smith. Discussion? Hearing none, roll call please. Holman? No. Aye. Ryan? Aye. Smith? Aye. Snipe? Aye. Snow? Aye. Holman? Aye. Aye. Cracky? Aye. Seven aye. Motion carries. Um, and also, I forgot to mention the motion prior to that carried as well. Um, moving on to information item, policy committee update. Ms. Ryan? Uh, thank you, President Snow. Uh, we met on July 25th, um, and we have the packet of policies that we discussed to move forward with um, for first reading for our next board meeting. And you can review those and some of them are updates from what was passed in the legislature and so those uh, we needed to get on, get rolling. Um, we also had a pretty lengthy discussion about some equity and diversity policies and um, Mr. Ray is going to draft a, a policy for, uh, for us to review as a committee and then we'll also bring that um, for in front of you for feedback. Um, and to address what Mr. Perlman um, brought up, uh, Dr. Holman and I also agreed that that, that that policy needs to be changed and if we can add that to this next set of packets uh, or to this set of policies that we have in front of us so that they can be information items in the next one so it doesn't have to wait until our September meeting, um, we would appreciate that and with that being said our next meeting is going to be in September because with the school year starting everybody is kind of in a big get to school mode so we um, are going to skip our August meeting and go to September any questions any questions for Miss Ryan thank you <clears throat> there's no receipt of reports um, and Dr. Holman. I move that the Board of Education go into closed session for the protection of the public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals to discuss with the superintendent, secretary to the board, and legal counsel, real estate, negotiations, pending litigation, personnel, and legal advice. There's a motion on the floor to go into closed session by Dr. Holman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Snipe. Roll call, please. Ryan? Aye. Smith? Aye. Snipe? Aye. Snow? Aye. Holman? Aye. Cracky? Aye. Perlman? Aye. Seven aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> Let me remind the board that the the purpose of closed session is for the protection of the public interest and for the prevention of needless injury to the reputation of individuals to discuss with the superintendent, the secretary to the board, and legal counsel. Real estate, negotiations, penal litigation, personnel, and legal advice. Let the record reflect the board run the closed session at 754. Thank you.
the record reflect board came out of closed session eight at eight thirty. Meetings adjourned.